AI is directly contributing to the 16% drop in jobs. If you're not fundamentally discovering something by which AI helps you do your work better today, you're not trying hard enough. Don't fumble the cognitive industrial revolution. Is this going to be something worse down the road? I feel like everyone is talking about this new MIT study, and it said that 95% of these AI pilot programs and companies actually don't lead to the scale, the impact we're looking for. And they argue that it wasn't necessarily the technology wasn't there, but there are organizational hurdles, people aren't adapting, there's internal policies, and so that sort of the uptake, especially for big companies who are used to doing things a certain way, is going to be much slower. So my question for you is, what do you make of this? Like, does this high failure rate mean that AI adoption is going to slow down across the board, especially because some uh, some organizations are still on the fence about AI adoption? The key thing about the uh, the AI revolution, the, the the current one, is it's scale compute um, uh, to scale with scale learning systems on scale data done by scale teams, and then it's scale adoption and you know, the societies, the industries, the companies will be the ones that kind of adopt that scale. And by the way, blitzscaling is obviously going to play in here as well, um, you know, in time, which will be the massive beneficiaries. And they'll be the beneficiaries the same way that, you know, Britain wasn't the country that, uh, you know, invented the Industrial Revolution, but embraced it early. And that's part of the reason why this relatively small island had a global empire for centuries. And I think that's part of the the adoption thing is really key. Now, it doesn't surprise me that the way that, you know, most, you know, traditional enterprise companies say, well, the way we adopt technology is we 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 assign a group of people, call it three to five or something, and we say we buy a pilot program and we test something and then we go, oh look, that's that's and that's not really working. Um, as a as a format, because this is a kind of just as it's a transformation of how individuals work, it's a transformation of how companies work as well. And the next study that should be done with this is compare and contrast startups, right? Because my guess is the startups will be ninety five percent are finding you know great acceleration and are integrating it yeah. and and all the rest in ways of doing it because they're building their work process from. From from ground up, and this is one of the re- things that I love about the 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 kind of work I do as an entrepreneur, a technology inventor, and investor in Silicon Valley and Greylock, and all the rest of this because of this exact thing. And so, if you're not uh, fundamentally uh, discovering something by which AI helps you do your work better today, mm-hmm. you're not trying hard enough. Yep. Like, and engage and find the ways it's helping. It doesn't mean it'll help you on everything. doesn't mean it'll take over your entire job. Actually, very, very few jobs can it take over the entire job of as of today. Um, but for every human being who is using language in how they work, if you don't speak at all, then maybe AI is not ready for you, but it still might be. But if you're using language at all, AI is helpful. Right. I mean, you often say that for any problem we have, technology is somewhere between 30 and 80 percent of the solution. And I wouldn't say this is, you know, sort of a problem. This is how can we enhance productivity and sort of in this instance, do our work lives better. Um, do you think more of the improvement in AI use and productivity over the next, let's call it year or two, is going to come from advancements in AI, like actually the technology or more sort of advancements in OB, advancements in how humans and organizations use it and integrate it? Well, actually, you're critically going to need both. But one of the things that exists today is kind of an underuse of the capabilities we have. Absolutely. So part of the reason why your question is, well, Airbnb, it's like, well, we've got a bunch of capabilities we're not actually using. Right. And if we don't get the use of the deployment, then the capabilities won't make a big difference. Now, that being said, you know, at different timescales, and the timescale of this one will likely be much faster than earlier technology adoption, because even when you started with the personal computer or the mobile phone, not only, you know, the tech gets built, and then eventually it gets deployed into things. And it's always a lag of deployment. Sometimes that lag of deployment is very short and sometimes long. I think part of the reason why people get surprised about the AI one is because 
you know, there's so much drum rolling about how yeah. transformative it is. And so they think you just turn it on and it starts working. There's actually, there's a whole bunch of things that happen. I'm not of the belief that it will just be the, well, once we have the one model, that one model will just be doing everything. I think there's a lot of fabric um, that goes into this. And what's more, the, the best model will undoubtedly be extremely expensive to run. And a bunch of the thing gets to the kind of the inference compute side of, of how does it become where intelligence gets added to everything with the same fluidity that electricity gets added to everything. And it's just, it's just the electricity of powering of intelligence that, that upgrades everything that you're doing. So adoption is a central part of it. Um, and actually, you know, as you know, from various conversations you and I've had, it's one of my worries about where, you know, democracies can screw themselves up because the democracy could lead to a impedance in the adoption of these technologies. I think probably the leading democracies with the leading impedances will probably be the Europeans because, um, you know, they're kind of AI act and, and all the rest in terms of this. And it's one of the reasons why I try to help them in various ways to say, no, no, don't, don't fumble the cognitive industrial revolution in this because the adoption will actually be very important to the future of prosperities of your industries and your societies and your children and their grandchildren in terms of doing this. And so that adoption actually, in fact, really matters. So perfect segue, because uh, I wanted to talk actually about sort of the global scene again. So recently, Donald Trump reversed policy and said that NVIDIA could sell their chips to China, uh, potentially in, in exchange for 15 percent of the resulting Chinese revenue. But then the Chinese government said to their companies, ByteDance, Alibaba, Tencent, that they had to suspend their purchase of NVIDIA chips because of, you know, data security concerns. And so according to the information DeepSeek, which we know is one of China's leading AI developers, they have begun training some of their next generation models on Huawei's Ascend chips, which is a shift away from NVIDIA. And so while DeepSeek still uses NVIDIA for its largest models, the partnership with Huawei signals a strategic turning point where China is trying to build a self-reliant AI ecosystem that can compete globally, even as U.S. companies like NVIDIA warned that the competition has undeniably arrived. So that is what the information has said about this sort of global back and forth. So my question for you is, does this deep seek pivot um, towards uh, essentially their own chips, towards Chinese chips away from NVIDIA, like, does that mean the end of NVIDIA dominance? Like, where does, does this further split the East and West um, in terms of technological power? Of course, if you're forking the availability, then it is creating incentives for the, um, for the Chinese to, to, to accelerate their own chip industry. Um, I do think that chip industry is a strategic power, a strategic capability that is, you know, kind of, on the the level of nuclear or um, energy, I think we fumbled over the decades in doing this in the U.S., and I think it's super important to to regain it in various ways. And of course, as we um, as we put in pressure to to you know actively limit the Chinese, that creates an incentive for them to build their own which then could lead to a decoupling, could lead to uh, ultimately them solving problems. And decoupling is generally speaking, um, while having competition, uh, decoupling is one of the things that can actually lead to further conflicts and further issues. And one has to be very careful on those things. It's a strategy that, that can be executed, but with competence mm -hmm. and care, not by, you know, uh, governance by tweet or, you know, other kinds of, of things that we are too, too much in the weeds of right now. Um, but I think it's a, um, and I'm, you know, generally speaking, a very strong voice in favor of um, the West's, you know, economic and national security concerns here. Um, but I don't think decoupling is a good idea. Now, the Chinese, part of what they're trying to figure out is say, well, okay, we do not want to be dependent upon, you know, the same kind of things we, the, we, the U.S. have recognized. We don't want to be dependent upon supply chain here. And, you know, I think part of the thing that the current federal government is learning is to say, well, we have dependencies upon the Chinese supply chains, too. We're being incompetent about how we're 
about how we're navigating this stuff. And I think, you know, we should up our level of competence on this. Some news that I was really excited about from last week uh, came from OpenAI. Obviously, you know OpenAI well. You led the first investment round in OpenAI. You were on the board for a number of years. Um, it's a company that we're really excited for all sort of the good that they can do on the AI side. And so last week they announced a $50 million fund and they want to help NGOs use AI for education, healthcare, economic opportunity, community organizing, all of the things that you and I often talk about that we think AI can be really fantastic for. One of the things I liked about this grant program in particular is they said they were launching it in early September. It closes in early October and they're going to give these grants out by the end of the year. So it is quick $50 million out the door to organizations, both old and new, that uh, can really use AI to, you know, create better well-being for all Americans. And so is this something that you think all of the AI labs should be doing or should this be governments? Should this be foundations? Like where should the responsibility to sort of use this AI for social good lie? In these kind of major things, I tend to be inclusive. So the short answer is everyone. So yes, the Frontier Lab should do it. Uh, yes, it's a great thing showing kind of open AI's leadership in um, its being a, a humanist organization and caring about what happens with human society and human individuals. And actually, they're focused on human alignment and safety and good for society and good for individuals. And I think this is a, another great piece of leadership from open AI in it. I think all everyone should be doing this sort of thing within the commercial. But I think it also means that governments and NGOs and all the rest should also, of course, be doing this because the transformation effect of AI, I think, you know, what will happen is we'll be going through rapid news cycles because just like we were talking about the MIT study, it'll be like, oh my God, everything's going to change. Wait, nothing changed in the last three to six months. You know, we're, you know, this is all overblown. It's all fictional, et cetera. And, you know, what frequently happens here is that the discourse over predicts the next one, two, three years and under predicts 10 years. Right. And so and so it's kind of like, look, the reason why they get in this to be experimenting, to be doing things, whether it's individuals, or other things, is because that's important. And so, for example, one of the things you know, just like we did, you know, kind of, you know, earlier on our on our in our podcast, you know, what is AI going to mean for education in various ways? And, and AI's impact for education is going to be very important. Getting it in deployment is very important. Getting it fully de deployed is very important. And I think that's, you know, obviously there's going to be a bunch of different, you know, kind of democratic and other institutions that are going to resist that, which will be bad for American children um, because they don't want to change their work processes. Um, and you even see like, you know, universities doing that. It's not just a, you know, a K-12 thing. Everyone's kind of like, oh, I don't want to, I, I'm used to how I teach my syllabus. and I'm used to testing. I have my tests. I have my curricula. Why would I change it? Sure. And it's part of the reasons why, you know, what like, what, you know, Larry Kramer and London School of Economics are doing, you know, it's kind of like providing the funds for them to kind of re restructure uh, professors' curriculums, you know, using AI as part of it. It's great leadership by them. There's others as well. You know, Michael Crow at ASU is always doing amazing things. But I think it's really, really important to do this stuff. And I think it's great that OpenAI is, is, is establishing this and saying, hey, we, um, we have partial responsibility to help here, too. Awesome. Uh, so another study that came out uh, last week uh, led by one of our uh, great friends, the researcher uh, and uh, professor at Stanford, Eric Grinjolfsson. And what he and his team looked at is they actually looked at ADP data from thousands upon thousands of employees in the U.S. He also actually they partnered with um, Anthropic uh, and Claude Code to do this and saw that if you looked at entry-level jobs in particular for 22 to 24-year-olds, those dropped 16% in those professions that you would say would most be sort of vulnerable to AI replacement. So customer service, um, computer engineering, things like that. Whereas when you looked at professions and entry-level that weren't sort of vulnerable to AI, nursing, in-person, trucking, they actually didn't see a drop. So they looked through a lot of reasons this could be. And their hypothesis is that AI is directly contributing to the 16% drop in jobs for 22 to 25-year-olds. So my question for you is, like, this is, this is not good. Their study uh, evokes the canaries in the coal mine. Is this going to be something worse down the road? Uh, could this just be aberrance in the data? Or is this something we need to prepare for over the coming years that AI will actually negatively affect that very first rung in the career ladder? I've 
personally thought that the first place that we're going to see a bunch of job replacement versus job transformation is in customer service. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why um, I've invested in, you know, some customer service companies. Um, I don't think, I think it's kind of like job transformation the same way that like moving agriculture to urban, uh, you know, kind of um, as the industrial revolution is actually in fact a good transformation. Um, there may ultimately be a different form, you know, maybe some forms of customer service will follow accounting. Like everyone thought when the spreadsheet was created, accounting uh, would just simply go away and instead it transformed into scenario analysis and, you know, kind of other kinds of detailed kind of risk planning and mitigation and, 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 and kind of economic planning. And maybe there will be a similar parallel where customer service becomes more of a strategically planned thing where it's customer engagement and, and has a bunch of different things and, and that there is a new set of human jobs that go into it. But the, any place where you're trying to get a human being to act like a robot, um, ultimately the robot will be better and customer service jobs tend to go through these weird scripting systems and all the rest. And you have this funny thing now within customer service where well, one of the things we're seeing, you know, in terms of, you know, anecdotally, and I don't know what the percentages are, but you get people calling into human customer service agents saying, please stop, you know, get me away from the AI and have me talk to, you, to a human being because the human being is trying to follow a script. And they're like, oh, this is so fucked up. This must be an AI, you know, as a, as a way it's doing it, even though it's like, no, no, I'm a human. It's like, no, that's what the AI would say. Um, and, and uh, you know, so it does not surprise me at all. Um, and actually, in fact, customer service, I think, will still be. Now, the computer engineering one was an interesting one to me. Um, uh, I still believe very strongly that um, actually, in fact, um, there will still be essentially unlimited jobs in the kind of computer science and engineering thing, in part because I think all human knowledge work, all human information work will have a software co-pilot for doing it. And so therefore, people who also think in terms of how computational programs work will be naturally enhanced in this. And I think there will be a much broader base of it. Now, in the first part of it, it may be that the, hey, entry-level coding jobs, we simply don't need, we, we don't know how to, ingri in, uh, to, to engage them yet. Because as we're beginning, because one of the other natural places to start using it is within engineering, you know, um, all highly good technical organizations are now actually, in fact, really going deep about like what kinds of ways can they be using, you know, AI co-pilots um, and other, you know, kind of uh, amplifications in order for be doing, doing code. And that may be kind of like getting them into an unknown era when it gets to it. Now, my general advice for organizations and also for the students would be is like, well, really embrace the current, the, the, the boldest edges of vibe coding all the rest. And to be using that to what you would bring to corporations to in terms of how you operate, because by the way, organizations are slow to adopt, even if they're kind of into it and you go, oh, hey, we need young people to be helping us with this when you're an AI native generation for how you, how you do it. That's something you could bring. Organizations should look for it. This is part of my second book, The Alliance, in terms of hiring entrepreneurial folks, and they should be they should be engaging with that. Now, the fact they may not be doing it yet, it may be a slower transition. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe that's what the hypothesis that Eric is discovering. I don't think it's a law of physics that plays out that way. Um, and you know, I'm still bullish that way, but it does cause me to go look at it, recheck my theories of the world, what needs to happen in order to get there. Um, and, you know, always love, you know, quality work from Eric, as well as obviously David Otter and, you know, kind of, and others uh, in these fields. Awesome. Reed, pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. Always. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network. It's hosted by Ari Finger and me, Reed Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Katie Sanders, Edie Allard, Tanasi Delos, Sarah Schleed, Vanessa Handy, Aliyah Yates, Paloma Moreno Jimenez, and Mulia Agudelo. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sepieva, Ian Alice, Greg Beato, Parth Patil, and Ben Rallis.